also don't want somebody to be able to throw GIS data at something and just have it crash because it runs out of memory. So actually a lot of the work of this project was just how do you handle, like how do you handle a 10 gigabyte raster if you have to do flow accumulation across it or something? And that's, and that's what we handled here. Uh, easy installation, uh, approximately. If you want to try it, you can pip install pile geoprocessing. You'll need Cython and Shapely, and what else, James? GDAL. GDAL, of course. SciPy. SciPy. And NumPy, right? Yep. Okay, and so, uh, anyways, it, I bet if you just did pip install geoprocessing right now, it might barf a little bit, but uh, depending on if you have, like, if you have Linux, it'll work great. Uh, but I have Windows here, and it works great, too. But anyways, we're, we're working on that. Uh, too, but I don't know. I just say I just say try it right now. It's just a source distribution. Eventually, we'll have a binary distribution. It's all uh, very very recent. Uh, cross compatibility with other open source software, and so we have a modified BSD license. So really, our intent there is you can use this for free in any capacity that you want to do. And I guess we prefer you don't do evil things with it, but we don't even restrict that. So if you want to go and like repackage this and make a billion dollars off it and, and write it as your own, basically the only thing you can't do there is say you're the natural capital project. And that's the license that we have applied to it. And then uh, the other design principle here, which is, uh, this is, this is our focus, and I wouldn't say this is technically true, but we try to be orthogonal in terms of what the API does. So we don't have, uh, we're, we're, of course, we'll, we'll do future releases of stuff. You'll see it in the end. We have, we have tons of stuff in there. But basically, like, are these routines that do things that don't intersect with each other? Like, is it some fundamental base API? And so we think about that by that too. And the other thing I've gotten there is new raster, like, uh, like we, we, we talk about our, our JS objects in terms of file names. And that's simply important because of the history of our project. And it's turned out to be very convenient. Um, so, but anyways, before I get into that, I, I feel like it's relevant to see the history behind how this project came uh, into being. And then it gives some sense of like, why is it the way that it is? Uh, and this won't take too long and hopefully it's an interesting story. So why does it exist at all? So uh, we're from the Natural Capital Project. It was founded in 2006. It's a partnership between Stanford University, uh, Woods Institute for the Environment, uh, the Nature Conservancy, the World Wildlife Fund, and the University of Minnesota Institute on the Environment. And what does that partnership mean? It means these are science installations that have come together and they give us core uh, funding. And of course, we, we're, we're mostly foundational grant supported. So like the Moore Foundation or the Packard Foundation or something. Uh, and then there's a bunch of professors that, that get into that. Anyways, in 2006, the intent here was how can you how can you incorporate the true value of nature into decision making so it's so you know you want to go up and you say hey i need to cut down a forest to do some logging like what's the value i'm going to get out of that it's not just the market price of the timber that forest is doing something else if you cut it down it may turn into a mudslide and then bury the city underneath it or it may just turn into muddy water and then you have to clean that when you get down into the into the city and all that costs money and so what you end up with is you build up this whole set of, of science and tools of like what is nature, uh, like what's the true like economic value of nature, not, in ter not necessarily in terms of dollars, but in terms of limited resources. And then that helps you make decisions about that. And I'm, that's about all I'm gonna say about that, except because we're getting to the software here. But basically that was developed and it exists and there's a book and you can buy it and there's all kinds of scientists that do that. And it's, it's some of the, like, the driving forces between what the Nature Conservancy and all kinds of environmental NGOs do nowadays. Um, but the thing to think about is, okay, so you do all this stuff and you develop this science and you publish a book and you write all these papers and you go like, who are you actually trying to affect? Uh, and it's ultimately people like this, like decision makers. And how do they, how do they think about those sorts of problems? Uh, not surprisingly, like through maps. Uh, in fact, somebody mentioned earlier today at a, at a talk I was at that basically if, you're, if your like science journal isn't like open source or free, then nobody else is gonna see it. And so this is sort of the driving uh, thought behind not just developing the science, but then how you gonna how you gonna make it useful, and so we think okay, well we want to operationalize that science into the language of the target audience, and so that that infers this GIS map. So this is sort of the history in 2006, and uh, Natural Capital Project. I hate to say we because I wasn't working there yet. This is the first release of Invest. Literally, it is a disk uh, and it's sitting down there that says July 7, 2000. Uh, must say 2008 or so. Uh, it's not even a version. It's just <laughs> you're just Invest. It's, 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 it's adorably naive at the time. Uh, but all this stuff was built on top of, uh, not surprisingly, ArcGIS. And, and uh, the first official release, it was actually called 1.0 beta, just like that. There weren't any extra zeros or anything. Uh, so Invest 1.0 beta was released in 2008 and is developed on, well, it probably wasn't the 10.0 pipeline. It's probably 9.3. Yeah, sorry, Greg. Uh, I'll change it later. Uh, anyways, there's a pro to doing this, right? Because you developed all this science. And you wrote your book, 
and you know who you want to influence, and you can go to a conference, like people, we literally went to the conference, we brought that CD, and it's like, here, you can boot this up, and you can take all this great science that we've, like the best science in the world about natural capital, and you can use it exactly in the environment that you're already using. Uh, and then it was quick to develop, and it was just like a little, it's just a little toolbox that's sitting off here. Uh, and of course, as you might guess, since this is an open source GIS conference, there are plenty of cons. Um, one this is actually kind of a big one. And it's, it's interesting because there's, like, there's actually lots of cons and there's lots of trade-offs to think about. But in this one, we're trying to release uh, Invest and it's free and open source, uh, but ArcGIS is not, but it requires it to run, right? So it's sort of like, hey, use our free software, but then you have to get this $1,000 piece of software <laughs> to get it to run. And that, it's interesting because that sort of works in the developed world, especially if you're an NGO, Esri will give you free licenses. But if you go to a developing world, like if you go to, say, Vietnam or something, like the local uh, Esri offices there, like they can't give out free licenses because literally everybody in the country who is open source, like that's the entire market, right? So it's, it's something to consider. It is not, it's not like there's a, like a, a driving stake here, why you, you think about this. Uh, there's another big one for us. Every time there was an upgrade to ArcGIS, we had to upgrade Invest, and oftentimes it broke for a variety of reasons. Uh, and then this was another one too. Every once in a while, there'd be like an ArcGIS bug of you know like not clean up a raster or something else was closed or who knows. And that all of a sudden that means the project that you're developing, you take on all those bugs as well uh, and those limitations. And then, as you can guess, there's just sort of a culture thing here, and you can guess what I mean by that. Um, so then, in, on so anyways, this work continues. Uh, February 16th, uh, 2001, Invest 2.0 was released, and that was, that was two days after I started working on the National Capital Project. Uh, and this was Invest, so that now we've got a variety of ecosystem services models. There's been a marine team that's funded in Seattle, that Greg's originally from, uh, or that you are, I don't know what you, you're, you're down here in Seattle now, but uh, Greg, you, Greg wrote a lot of these models for the marine team. Um, but then there's these other software needs that start to be building here. So here's platform crisis. These are great pictures from, we, we go all around the world doing all kinds of projects. And this is from a water funds project in Colombia. And people are looking really concerned about the state of invest. It's not really, but I thought they were good pictures. Okay, so uh, here's a big one. Okay, great. We have all these standalone models. So we have something like, we have a timber model, and we have like a coastal protection model, and we have a sediment model. And it's like, wouldn't it be great if the output of one model went into the other one, and then it all sort of hooked up and it worked great? I get there's some ArcGIS stuff that does that, but I, I'm, I'm simplifying the complexity of that. Another one is like, right now, I, I would call uh, uh, an ArcGIS tool, like when you click it, I would call it a, a form-based paradigm, where you click it, you say all the files, you hit run, and then you look at the results. And that's, that's great for sort of packaging up those runs, but what if you want to start to have feedback and, and so forth? It's, it's like, well, what are you going to do now? You can start to develop arc objects and get even deeper in that platform, or, or who knows what? It's just something to think about. Um, here's another one. We want to run like thousands of times for optimization, and maybe you want like really fine game control over, I'm, I mean, I'll pick here, like the GIS like reroute, maybe you want to flip a couple pixels in a map, but you want to like say reroute an entire DEM because of it. And so you start to feel like this, just like, wow, if I had finer control over those, those mechanisms, maybe I, could, uh, maybe I could make that go a little better. Um, and then the maintenance cost was a little unpredictable, too. This was, it, this was upgrades of, of ArcGIS and, and bugs we might find in them. Uh, and there's some culture there, too. Okay, so some alternatives that we considered. We considered all of these and executed all of them. The very first one, there was the history behind it. There was a, a more, we got a more foundation grant to try out the Google Earth Engine. It was very new at the time. And it promised a whole bunch of stuff. Uh, it was basically, and everybody's heard of it, because I was at a talk earlier, and everybody raised your hands. So you know what that is. Um, another one is uh, Clark Labs, uh, a piece of software called Adresi that's a, like a land change modeling piece of software. It made a lot of sense to stick in an environmental ecosystem service package into that. And so we got some funding to potentially do that. And actually, that was just released. Uh, sorry. TerraSet is like the next generation of Adresi. It was like released like a couple months ago. And there's an invest set of modules that are embedded inside them. And ultimately what Clark Labs did is they, uh, they took our open source uh, invest models and they just rewrote them themselves in their proprietary Java language, which is totally fine. Uh, of course, there's GrassJS too. Uh, and we had, uh, I don't know, I'm actually kind of curious, maybe after the talk, if somebody's like really, really good at GrassJS, I'd love to talk to you about this, but that, that, tend, that ended up not working out too well for us. Or we could develop it ourselves. Uh, and we eventually just sort of tried all these things. 
the Google Earth engine, it was sort of a combination, I mean a big, a big sort of showstopper on the Google Earth engine. You can't do routing, you can do pixel stack stuff great, but you can't look at your neighbors. And that of course has to do with the fundamental like map reduce algorithm that Google has on its back end. Uh, so that didn't quite work out. Terraset, we don't own it, GRASS.js, basically it was hard for us to sort of package up GRASS as like some kind of embedded GIS engine, which I always hoped would work, and then we could ship that along with Invest. And so instead we developed ourselves, and we sort of did all these things in parallel. Um, anyways, Invest 3.0, we released it uh, last year, almost, uh, almost not too long away from today, actually. And uh, we had a big party. And I don't have any pictures of that party, so here's James wearing a crown and looking, and looking salty. Uh, but it was, it was great, it was very exciting. And so what this was, this was literally our first version of Invest3, like, you can download this, guess what? You don't need ArcGIS. Nobody in our, pro well, some people have ArcGIS now, but it's like a very Q-centered, QGIS-centered organization now. Uh, and anyways, it's, I don't know, it was great to see, like, oh, great, that, that, that totally worked. Uh, sorry, I guess I said I wasn't gonna talk too much about Invest, but I'm talking about it all the time. I will soon not talk about it. Uh, so what, what this provided, it gives you an API for, like, you can script it, it's got, like, a user interface, uh, we've had some derivative tools that have some feedback, it's basically all those issues we worried, that I mentioned before, that we wanted to say, okay, we did invest 2.0, what are these things we really want to do? We're starting to be able to do that stuff now. Um, no, not in part because we have our own uh, GIS engine underneath. Um, this is a big one. This is where PyGeo Processing comes out of. High performance implementation of raster stack and hydrological routing. And then uh, we just feel strongly about this. So this, is, this seems like a positive contribution to open source JS software. Oh, and to give you a sense of how big this project is, we probably get, we probably, we get like 500 downloads of invest a month. Is that is right? Like maybe once we got 1,000 or something. If you Google the word invest, it is, it is the top hit, which is surprising since it's about money. Uh, but, uh, but that, anyways, that's sort of the sense of it. And then since we've posted, uh, since we put, uh, PyGeo processing on PyPy. We've had like a thousand downloads since like Thursday, and I get those are all robots and stuff, but still it's like, obviously there's like a wider audience for this stuff uh, that we feel like is a, a good contribution. So PyGeo processing was born. Um, we need a logo. <laughs> okay, so anyways, there's two modules. So back, to, that's all I'll talk about now is, is PyGeo processing. So there's these two modules. One is just, so you like import this stuff. If you pip install, then you say, uh, import pygeoprocessing.geoprocessing. Geoprocessing is a package that's all about raster stuff in, in general. Um, and then there's a, there's a workhorse in there that I'll, I'll run through uh, a simple example and a little more complicated example. If we have lots of time, I'll show you some code at the end. But this is like, I feel like this is a sort of a good picture of what it does. Like say, here, like this would be perfect for it. Like say you have some kind of land cover map and then you have some kind of like Python dictionary object that will map uh, you know, integer IDs to like floating point values or something, and then you just want that to happen over this giant raster, and you don't care how big it is. And you don't want to bother making the output raster, you just want it to be the right one, and I don't know, maybe you want to change the pixel size or something, and so it, it does that kind of stuff. Um, and then routing is the one about, you have a DEM, and you want to see how stuff flows downhill, or, or where it comes from uphill. Um, and there's, there's a smaller set of algorithms out though, about those, except I'd say they're arguably a little more advanced. Well, I don't know, it just depends. They're a different kind of advanced, I guess. So first here, we'll look at uh, geoprocessing. So geoprocessing, it has this workhorse function called vectorized data sets. And the etymology of that is vector from vector numpy's vectorized operation. And the data sets is from the GDAL uh, raster class data set. And the thing that you should also realize is we're going through these APIs. Like, I realize now, somebody point, actually Greg pointed out how horrible of a name this is, because it, like, it sounds like geometry raster-like function. And that's not what it is at all. What we're trying to say here is a bunch of rasters on disk, and you want to like stamp out some operation on them like all in parallel. So that's the vectorized part, and the data set part is all those, all those operations. Uh, and so anyways, you want to use this whenever you have like some kind of per pixel operation. So this would be sort of like, I, I mean, it's, it is equivalent to say some like raster algebra. Uh, although since it's, it's got, it basically it'll, it'll take in a uh, Python function and many of the scoping rules around Python functions, including like closures and modules and so forth. And so you can do all kinds of fancy things with it. So this is a very basic use of it. Like say you start with this, this is some, this is some clipped precipitation raster I just grabbed from our example data set. And then you write some function here. It's just this. So this says, so okay, I want to mask the wet regions, and basically I want to return like if the precipitation value is greater than 2,000, this must be millimeters per year or something. You know, return true, otherwise return false. So like that's the operation I'm going to pass to the data sets. 
And then you get out this, not terribly, but very accurate raster, like that would be what would pop out of it. So you're seeing there is red, I just shaded it so red's one and, uh, and gray is zero. So, so great, so you get, like, you get like see how that's useful. Um, I'll get deep into the API here in a little bit. But like it's so much more than that. So this is more in general what it is, like an arbitrary operation to just a stack of rasters like as big as you might possibly want. Uh, like this could simply just be like a directory. Yeah, like you could just grep a directory and just jam all those in there if you like. Uh, various, like there's no need for them to even be totally aligned. They probably should be in the same projection, but they need not over, and they should probably, no, they don't even need to overlap. It depends on what you want to do. Uh, they don't even need to be the same pixel sizes. So you got 30 meter ones and 120 meter ones. Uh, uh, vectorized data sets will let you specify how you want, how you want to handle that. Um, alignments, data types, right? You could have like floats and booleans and unsigned bytes or whatever you like. And even if you have like an AOI, like some geometry, and you're like, and like besides all that, I want to only care about this area here, and you want to stamp it down. And so here's an example. And by the way, I'm pulling all these from our our software that we develop here. So what you see here, uh, I don't remember exactly what all these layers are. I would guess probably the one furthest underneath is probably a land cover map. The next one up is probably like. Uh, an erosivity map, and then that's that precipitation layer map you saw before, and then I have a little, uh, uh, some geometry there that's uh, some subwatersheds. And this is up in the Willam Will Willamette Valley up in Oregon, where we got these. And then we have an even more complicated function, uh, which you probably can't see very well here. And I, I, I just tried to make something arbitrary for the talk today, but I think it does something like, uh, find all the places where the precipitation is greater than 2,000, and in that case, and only care about Land covers that are forest, like 50, land covers 58 through 60 or something. So I have a list inside of there. And then if it's also in the AOI, like, like add them all together. And if it's not, then like multiple, just like get the land cover value out. I don't know, just something complicated like that. And if we get some time, I can go into a more detailed example of that. And then you get out, I've zoomed this in. This will be like, that's literally the raster you would get out of, out of that thing there. So you can see it's all nicely clipped to the, uh, the geometry there. I haven't had to worry about there, oh, sorry, there are different pixel sizes underneath those rasters there on the left. And I think I've said here, just give me a 30 meter pixel output. And um, um, yeah, anyways, you, so maybe you can start to feel how this would be potentially uh, pretty powerful. And another thing I wanna talk about here is, because uh, part of our design principle is not that just it exists and it's an API that's file-based, but also we care about it being uh, runtime efficient and memory efficient too. <clears throat> so, this is a, this, so this is approximately what vectorized data sets does when you call it. The very first thing it does, you pass it that raster stack, it will take that raster stack and you can say things about what you want your output raster to look like. Do you care about, like do you care about, so say I have a giant raster over here, one over here, and then a small one over here. You could say, I care about the place where all the rasters intersect. And it'll just give you a nice little tight box there. Or say I'm doing something, the other day I was doing a, like a global bio uh, uh, carbon analysis and I had like, I had like Africa and South America and China, but they're all different rasters. I just wanted to be in one giant raster. So I did was just call vectorized data sets. And here I said, uh, union the bounding boxes. So I made this giant output raster. And then my function was just, if there's data to find, just, just return it. And I get this giant data set out. Uh, you can also say something like, make it as big as uh, this particular raster that I have coming in. And then there's actually like, uh, I think I'll actually kind of show the API here in a second, but there's, you have a lot of flexibility over that. And all the flexibility actually comes from, it's not like we were just sitting around and thinking what would be useful. This is basically all like, like horribly dog fooded first because it's the tools that we developed specifically for like GIS heavy uh, ecosystem service applications. So anyways, that happens first. And then you get this magical little set of outputs here. Okay, so there's like the bounding box. Uh, you'll see, I mean, I shouldn't have made the little sub boxes there, but you'll see why I will in a second. So anyways, imagine that like black uh, uh, data set there. That's like all those data sets and they're all stacked up. They're all right on top of each other right now. So there's actually three of them underneath there. You just can't see them all. And uh, I just, I just attended that. So it's uh, something to keep in mind. It'll make the output data set for you. I'll make the output raster for you based on what all those parameters were. And say we said it's a 30 meter pixel size. We'll do that. Then the next thing it'll do it's gonna, inter it's gonna iterate over these process rasters here, the, the second box from the left, reading a memory block at a time. A memory block being defined is how GDAL defines a memory block. So, so like the most efficient way that you can read a chunk of raster off of a disk. Uh, and in that first step there, it makes sure that all those clipped rasters are all the same memory block size. So these might be 256 by 256 memory blocks, maybe it's blocked by rows, it doesn't matter, it's gonna do it at a time. In this example here, we're, we're doing it a block. 
So we'll do something like this, like, like grab that one, do whatever that operation is, and then stamp it out there on the right. And, and by the way, we have this, this function here. So you can just imagine this thing sort of going along and chunking all these things out, just stamping those rasters together. It actually runs a lot faster than this animation. Uh, this is the API over here that I put up here to just sort of show you it's like kind of heavy and like I get, I mean, like I think like what, what are we doing at this conference? We sort of like, we think like this is a contribution to GIS open source software. So I like, I would very much like if you're paying attention, you find this stuff interesting. I'd like, I just want to give you a taste of this. There's no way I would like describe all the things you can do here. But if you're just sort of like eyeballing what these arguments are, like I feel like that gives you some sense of, of how workhorsey this function is. So uh, like this will be like the list that you plug in. That's just that Python function you say. This is like literally the path to the file and disk you want out. This will tell you like what, what do you want your, your file type to be? Do you want it to be like a floating point or an integer? You specify that. How big do you want your pixels to be? 30 by 30? Plug that in there. Your bounding box mode, that's the thing of do you want the union of all the data sets or the intersection or do you want it to be the same as one of the data sets coming in? You just pass that in as a string. And there's a whole bunch of other stuff in here, including some things we're working on on doing um, parallelization, like multi-core stuff. But so maybe not surprisingly, like this runs so fast, we actually haven't felt the need to do parallelization for these types of things. It's actually throttled reading data off of disk as opposed to computation. So we don't, we don't worry about that too much at this point. It's not to say it won't be later. So that's sort of an example of, of what geoprocessing is like. There's a lot more in there. But um, let me talk about uh, routing next. So routing is the one where you have, it's the kind of problems where you have uh, height maps, you have DEMs, and they want to do something about flowing across the landscape. So, uh, okay, that's what I just said. Use routing when you want to do flow across a DEM. So here's how I do. You start with an input DEM, and this is a much, this is a, the, the number of uh, functions in this module are much smaller because, uh, uh, I don't know why, I mean, because they're harder. <laughs> it just took a lot, it's probably like a lot of our development went into, went into this one here. Oh, and the other thing about this, this is a very specific, it's a D infinity flow direction. We don't, we don't do D8. Uh, I mean, we used to do D8, but we actually find it a lot more uh, useful for our science to do D infinity. So anyways, you can put this DEM and you get these lovely uh, flow, like these D infinity flow directions out like that. That just comes, uh, out of the, I, I generated these just with our, our script this morning. Uh, here's the flow accumulation for that same thing. There's also, uh, unfortunately it's called distance to stream. I just found out that GIS would call this uh, flow distance. So like given a point on a landscape, how far is it? Not like a direct, not Cartesian distance, but like downstream flow distance to get to a stream. And maybe why these are a little more complicated than you would, uh, than you would first think. We're dealing with uh, D infinity flow directions here. So it's not like one pixel flows into another. One pixel flow into two pixels. Uh, and so that gets a little complicated when you're walking upstream or downstream. You can have streams diverge and you can get these really beautiful maps. Uh, but then you also have to worry about it being memory efficient and so forth. I'll talk a little bit about that. Oh, and then in general, when we're like all of our stuff that's inside of Invest, it's usually some combination of the vectorized data sets you saw before and then these routing algorithms here. So this, this in particular here, this is a combination of uh, reclassifying a land cover map into like surface roughness values, like what kind of vegetation do you have on the landscape? What are the flow paths upstream and downstream? And this is literally a map that if you look at the value of a pixel here, it will tell you the percent of sediment on that pixel that will then wash to the outlet. And so, you, so I don't know, and they, and they look kind of pretty too. So I just wanted to toss that up there to, to show you how we use these things. Um, so let me just talk a little bit about what's happening when we're doing flow direction and I want to do uh, flow accumulation and then I want to also do uh, flow path as well. Uh, and, you, and you'll see why, you'll see why I want to talk about it because there's, so the very first thing we assign, um, we go across, oh, I should have started with a DEM. Anyways, you plug in a DEM and you try to assign these D infinity flow directions wherever possible. And this D infinity algorithm that we implemented is exactly that one down there by Terabotton that also there's an implementation of it in uh, tau DEM. Uh, but I might argue at least the one that we do is, is just a little bit faster. And uh, by the way, I went to a talk this morning of somebody and he said, uh, it sure would be great if open source software cited uh, journal papers. And boy, we sure do. And like right in the code, we'll actually say like, this implements equation 11 from this paper. So it's kind of fun to see if you care about that stuff. Um, but then what will happen, what's very common on a DEM, you will have flat areas, you'll have plateaus. And that might be because you have a, like a surface, like a body of water, or in this particular case of the Willamette Valley, for some reason, like all the way around here, around Corvallis, it's just, I forget what the actual height is, but it's like just like 45 meters all the way across. It's just like this giant floodplain. 
Um, and so when you're looking, when you're trying to assign the infinity flow direction here, really what you're looking at is like, it's very local. Like each direction on, oh, my mouse is not showing up there. Uh, so each direction on a, uh, on a pixel is just defined locally from what its neighbors are. But if they're all the same height, then you can't really define a flow direction. So what we do next is we drain the flat areas and we use this, uh, uh, this technique, an efficient alignment of drainage direction over flat surfaces in rag, uh, ra raster digital elevation models. And it looks like this. Uh, there's multiple steps. First thing you do is you find all the high regions in your plateaus. So this is, this is after you've already attempted to find all your flow directions. Then you go through another run of the map and you say, okay, look at all these places. We couldn't find flow directions. Why not? They must be in a flat area or they, they could be a pit. Um, we'll, we'll handle that in a second. So the first thing you do is you make this grid. It's, it's sort of complicated. It's like, a, it's like a breadth first search going upstream from, uh, no, I'm sorry. This one's sort of like a breadth first search from going from the high edges of a flat and you're kind of like trying to drain away from it. Uh, there's another phase where you find the drain of the flat and you do a breadth first search sort of going out and so you get these like two rasters. You do multiply them by two and subtract one and whatever and you get uh, uh, like it's really interesting. It's like this relative gradient of even though you're in a flat area, what the drain should be. And then what we do from that, then we run D infinity on that one more time. So we're able to route even in like giant plateau areas. And God, I really should I really should have highlighted that because it's really prevalent here where it's just all totally flat here. And really, if you don't do this on this map, you get all kinds of gaps everywhere because there's reservoirs all, all throughout that DEM. Um, so anyways, that's relevant of thinking about like, it's more than just D infinity. It's also, it's also fixing these flat regions. Oh, and uh, this doesn't actually handle uh, pits yet. Uh, and that's something that's on our, our to-do list too. Okay, so the next one is, what are we doing when we're doing flow accumulation? And so why is this even worth talking about? Uh, it's worth talking about a little bit because, so I've just drawn down here. This is like considering the flow accumulation of a single pixel. And you have to see what's flowing upstream into it. But if you can see, I sort of lazily drew these, uh, these drainage vectors. So it's not as if like one pixel is flowing perfectly into another one. It's like, what are you flowing at? You have some, you, it's like, you know, you're flowing at uh, uh, like 217.5 degrees or something. You have to figure out what pixels get what share of your upstream flow. Uh, so it's simply worth talking about that. Uh, and basically it's, it's another kind of breadth first search that we do. So first of all, find all the drains on the entire raster and there might be a pit and you just push those on a stack and you're like, okay, I'm just, what I'm gonna do, I'm just gonna work my way up this raster and I'm gonna drain all these things down. Um, so while your stack's not empty, consider all the inflowing neighbors like you would down here, like that, that number, that brown number 23 down there. And if it's calculated, what you end up doing, if your neighbor's calculated, you figure out the proportion that's flowing into you and you take that amount of the flow accumulation. So if, the, if you look at that pixel there that says 20, uh, like 20, like 20 units of flow accumulation doesn't actually flow downward. Some of it flows a little bit to the left and some of it flows straight down. And if you really uh, cared about that, that would be the, the equation for it. And like, I want to get into that so much as I want you to think like, oh, I think I might use Pi Geo processing. What's going to happen if I have uh, the infinity flow directions? How does that work? And ultimately what you're doing is you're kind of doing a weighted average of everything that's flowing in. And uh, maybe I can zoom in on one of these rasters, but then these end up looking very pretty because you get these nice smooth directions and sometimes you get streams that diverge and it's, it's totally awesome. Uh, this is just a little example run of like what it looks like when, so I, I, I basically put a little break inside this algorithm and I just, I just like dumped a raster every thousand iterations. So what we do here, uh, we identify that watershed. So you see the little red dot down there. So that'd be like, that'd be our only drain. Like that would go on the stack. And then I let it run for a thousand iterations and see so what it does. It sort of works its way up, but it hasn't calculated anything to the left yet. And do another little thousand and see like that next red dot. That's like where it's working from. And it sort of works its way up there. Anyways, you can see how this goes and it starts filling it through and it's pretty and it's nice and smooth, right? So that's neat. Um, the other thing though is you saw what that had to do. That had to like go and search all the neighbors and the raster everywhere. And like that's, that's, I mentioned before why the Google Earth Engine didn't work for us because we can't, we can't program that on the Google Earth Engine. Google Earth Engine can stamp out pixels, uh, but it can't like check all the neighbors around. So then uh, the other problem is like, okay, what if your DM is 10 gigabytes now? It's not as if you can like say load that into a giant NumPy array, because believe me, I've tried. And like it'll like either it'll either memory error or you'll just it, like NumPy can only make arrays that are so big. So we do instead for that. Uh, what if the raster is big? We uh, so this is another raster we use. This is like oh like this is Iowa. I wish I could point. Iowa's like this right here. And I think this is a 90 meter something like this. 
And uh, so what we do in this case, there's no way we can load this in memory all at the same time. So what we do is we, we, uh, we basically make a direct, a two-dimensional direct mapped cache. Uh, just like if you did any computer science and you did your, like your uh, uh, computer architecture, it's like that kind of a cache. And so what we're doing here, we'll start in the drain down here in the Mississippi River down at the very bottom. And we might say, okay, let's start doing that thing. So that animation I was doing before where we like started a drain, we start working our way up. So what we do right now, that little red block, that thing's just in memory right now. We might be going up there, we might be like etching in what the flow accumulation is. Uh, but we don't necessarily write out to disk, we just hold on to it because we don't know we're going to be done yet. But then we're going to work our way up a little bit further. So they're like, oh, okay, I got to load another one. You can imagine this thing sort of working its way up and it's going to the right here, so it's got to load that. But then it needs to load this one. Uh, uh, but then, like, say we can only hold, okay, so that's working. We can have four in memory at a time, but now we have to hold a fifth one. So we have to do some cache management of, like, which one of these should we get rid of? And then we have to remember to save that stuff to disk, and then we have to load the new one up. And so the algorithm deep inside will do something like this. Like, okay, we're done with that. Save that off. We might load it back later. Now load up this new one here and process it. And so, like, it'll finish. It'll be like, good, I'm done with that. It'll save it off. It'll save that one off. It'll save that off, one off. And now it's ready to come back down to the Mississippi outlet. It'll have to like load that again off of disk and it'll do a little no another update on it. And so the other thing that the thing I want you to think about here is you're thinking about PyGeo processing. What else is it doing? It's doing this, this rather non-trivial uh, uh, memory management underneath too, as uh, well for all these things. Um, right, right. Okay, uh, and then just this one last one here. Uh, what's, what is routing doing when it's calculating the flow distance? I did this. This is on the fly, I used to call it distance to stream. Um, the only thing that's a little bit tricky here, I won't, I won't go through like a big example of this, but it's ultimately, if we're looking at flow distance downstream, you don't have, if you're like draining from a particular cell, it's not like I'm just draining to one, I'm draining to potentially two. And so what's the distance downstream? It's sort of the weighted average between the two. It's sort of an interesting problem to think about here. So to the left there we have, you know, it's 120 units downstream, and to the right it's 150 units downstream. So how do we calculate 169.44? Well, we have to look at what that, that vector, uh, what that vector is pointing into. And we basically do a weighted average between the two. And the only other little sort of interesting thing here is if we were to flow directly from this cell into that one, and it's a 30 meter cell. Well, actually, from here to here, it's a 30 meter cell. That's what this plus 30 is. And if we flow from here to here, that's going diagonal. So this is actually, this is actually 30 times square root of two. So you can get the, the hypotenuse growing there. Anyways, it averages out, and that's, and that's the, the flow distance that you get. Um, okay, but there's like a lot more to our API. Uh, the geoprocessing package, it has this many functions in it. <laughs> And a lot of them are, are prob I mentioned earlier about some orthogonality. There's some history inside of this one. When we first started developing this package, uh, we were worried about, we thought it would be a great idea to have the user handle all the GDAL data sets. And for a variety of reasons, including like reference and horrible segmentation fault issues, we decided that was a bad idea. And then we thought it'd be a good idea to say, well, let's not just refer to stuff as file name, Let's refer it to like a universal resource indicator. So there's like a lot of URIs that are strewn around here. The URIs are really file names. <laughs> so uh, we, aren't, we are not married to this particular, uh, in fact, we want to change some of this stuff, but there's, I don't know, you might just like look through here and see things like, like there's an, there's an aggregate raster values URI there. That's the equivalent of ArcGIS's zonal statistics, but it's like you can call it from, uh, from PyGeo processing. There's a reclassified by dictionary there. That's a way you can say, take a land cover map and you can reclassify it. But unlike ArcGIS, you can reclassify into floats. There's no need to just be integers. Uh, so anyways, there's a lot of good stuff like that. Oh, I see a line data set list in there. That's the one that like, you can just pass in a whole bunch of rasters and it'll like, just like clip them all out so they're all the same size. Maybe you don't want to use our stuff at all, but you just want to get a nice, clean raster stack. So there's all that. And then um, on routing, there's just a, a smaller set of that. So you have your flow accumulation there. I've just bolded the ones that we looked at. Flow accumulation, distance to stream, and flow direction d infinity. Uh, some other things that are in there. There's things that are like called like route flux. And it's basically, it's sort of like doing flow accumulation, except it's basically an integrator where you can go along upstream. You can have arbitrary weights. And if you wanna, if you don't just care like what your units are upstream, you can collect other information. That, it can get kind of complicated too, but it's, it's helpful for uh, the project that uh, is helpful for invest. And I think, it's, I think it's useful in the long run too. But these are like, I feel like I gave you a sense of like, if you're thinking about PyGeo processing, like this is the big stuff that it does. Um, and so here I'm gonna write, I'm gonna, 
say a conclusion here, but I think I have time, so I just wanted to show you what this code looks like and potentially how fast it runs and how you might interact with it. Uh, these are open source goats. They aren't really. It's just uh, a nice picture I was looking at. Okay, so, uh, okay, natural capital. Oh, here's the whole point. Pygeo processing for the long haul. So we're very lucky at the Natural Capital Project to be, so we developed like this entire uh, uh, suite of tools. We have Invest, Rios is a landscape optimization uh, uh, piece of software that's used a lot in Latin America right now where people can say, hey, I want to invest money to restore watershed. Where's the best place I should do it? And optimization problems that happen on the back end. Opal is similar, it's a, it's a permitting tool. So you can say, hey, I am forced to do a mine permit in this like rich biodiversity area but I want to, I have to by law offset and restore other areas, like where's the best place to do that? Anyways, um, uh, PyGeo processing runs all that stuff. And the other thing to realize here is that it's like, it's like well supported, We're, we have our 10th anniversary uh, this year at Natural Capital Project. And so it's like part of like this developing set of, of, of tools that's like well supported by NGOs and foundational grants. And so it's something that's like, it's something that's not going away. And, and we feel really, uh, oh, do I have like time? Oh, okay. Uh, oh, am I out of time? Sorry, I didn't understand your gesture. Oh, shoot. Okay, well, that's it. That's it. Um, anyways, this is all of us. I, I, I want to make it just look like the three of us. There's tons of people at the Natural Capital Project. And uh, anyways, thanks. Sorry I went too long.